Hello there, and welcome back to Daddy Roll the One. I'm Martin, and this is another video in my series on how I prep for a campaign in general, but also for the specific sessions that take place within that campaign. In this video specifically, I'm going to be talking about the very first session that I ran in this campaign that's currently going on almost three years. Uh, October will be three years. This is a campaign that I am running for my teenage daughter and her friends and one dad. But the advice in here, as I talked about last time, is not specific to kids. It's not necessarily specific to teens or tweens. It's just good advice, or at least it's my advice. I would love to hear your advice, what you do differently or tips and tricks that you have. And there's going to be a very certain part of the video where I'm going to ask for your help for something that is still a challenge for me now, as it has been for the past three years with this particular group of players. Last time, we talked about the session zero that we had for this particular game, and we talked about how we created the characters. There are five players. There are three elves, a cleric, and a thief. So just as a reminder, and we're running BX D&D &D 1981, and in this particular version of the game, there are seven character classes, and those character classes are cleric, dwarf, elf, fighter, halfling, magic user, and thief. So dwarf, elf, and halfling in this game are classes. So my daughter and two of her friends were elves. And then we again, we had a cleric and we had a thief. So at the end of the previous session, I asked the players. Now, normally I would say, what do you want to do next time? And that's how I would start to plan for a session. However, in this case, since we hadn't had a session, I asked them to just do two things for me. Uh, of course, they didn't do either of the two things, but I asked them to please buy their equipment. So we had used, we had rolled our gold in, in this version of the game. Uh, it's 3d6 times 10, and that's your starting gold. And so every player had done that, and I asked them to go through the book. We use old school essentials, which is essentially this. It's just with you know different layout that's a little bit easier, and it also keeps me from ruining or you know, you know getting more wear and tear on my my book than I already have uh, from my older books. So I asked them to buy equipment. There's a section in here on the equipment tables, and so I'd ask them buy your equipment, weapons, armor, and none of them did that. So I even sent them to PDF for this. So they had the list. They didn't do that. Send them an email. I also asked them to please let me know how their characters know each other and why they were adventuring. And they didn't do that. The farthest we got is that the three elf players had decided that their elf characters were all going to be related. Originally, they were going to be sisters. Then they changed it to being cousins. And they said that their elves... Uh, were from the town of Wibbleville. That is not a town name that I had given them. It's not one that I would have chosen myself, but I didn't want to have the first thing I did for this group be a negative thing. I didn't want to tell them, like, eh, I'm going to stifle your creativity because I don't like that name. Pick something else. So I just went with it. Um, I did decide that they had a master who had taught them their spells. That's how I'm dealing with magic in this world. Any arcane practitioner of magic, which includes elves in this game, needed to have a master teach them their spells, where they get their spells from. And so I decided that their master was a really old and he basically taught them everything that he could. He taught them each one spell. I rolled the spells randomly. So in this version of the game, there are 12 spells each for levels one through three of magic user spells. And so I rolled the D12. And rather than having them pick one, they didn't really know the spells. They didn't know what they did. And two, I kind of just wanted the random element of like, let's see what happens. Like what happens if I get a spell that you wouldn't normally pick at first level and then let's figure out how to use it. So I rolled the D12. I got hold portal for one player. I got read magic for one player and I got shield for one player. So that was, that was how we started out. And then I told them that their magic user had, or their master had told them that in order to learn more about magic, they needed to leave Wibbleville and travel throughout the world and find a new master to learn new magics because he had taught them everything that he knew. So that was sort of the pretense that I used to get them on the road. And because none of them had really told me how they knew each other, I pushed them along and just said, okay, you're in this town of Grimmagstadt during a fall festival and you got there. And along the way, the three elves came across a cleric, a traveling cleric and a thief. And the thief decided for her background, this is going to sound very familiar to people, um, but you got to remember, this is a first time player. She has no experience with role playing games, has never watched an actual play, nothing like that. She decided that her thief character was an orphan and didn't know who her family was. And she was just kind of like, you know, didn't even really get into who raised her, essentially. And then the cleric player did a little bit more. He talked about how uh, he was from this very 
marginalized faith or, or very, you know, it's a small cult essentially in, in the world. And it's something that I had kind of offhand mentioned when I sent out some details on some world building. I'll we'll get into that a little bit later. And he picked a country that worshiped uh, that, that cult that was like their state faith. And I had no details for this. It was just an offhanded comment. I could just, you know, they're part of this cult. And so he said, that's mine. I want that one. And so I worked with him to kind of help him develop what this faith was about and asked him a bunch of questions. He gave me a lot of stuff. And the dad player is actually pretty involved. And so I sent him a document about the faith that he decided to follow for his character. And that's this document that you see here. And that's really based on input that he gave me. So he took that. And uh, that was really it, though. Um, the other thing that was interesting is that my daughter and her three friends, so the three elf characters and the thief, those are the four younger players. Uh, they were about 11 at the time. They decided that their characters were going to be roughly the same age as they were. So I've never done that. When I played as a kid, I always made characters that were you know, capable adults that were could do things. They decided to make their characters, you know, roughly teenagers. The elves knew that elves, the elf players know that elves are long lived, but they said we're the equivalent of an elf teenager. The thief player made her character 12 years old. So I know in later editions of the game, like in AD and D, they actually have tables that you roll to see like how old your character can be and like how what's the minimum age and all that stuff. I didn't care about any of that. She wanted to play a 12 year old. I played up during the game. I have NPCs talk to her as she is a kid and mentioned things like, are, where are your parents? Are you sure you're supposed to be out here? Like who's, who's looking out for you and, and things like that. And it also affects how they get treated when they're trying to get themselves hired for missions because they all look very, very young. But also because they were young, I didn't want to start them out in a tavern. I thought that could be a little bit weird. So I started them out in a town for this fall festival. So as you see, <laughs> if you could read my horribly written notes here, I was started to make notes. Our first session was held in October of 2020. And I was like, these are the things I need to do before that. I need to figure out the details of the else master. We talked about that. I needed to figure out for the cleric player, what the details were on his mystery cult that he followed. I need details of the town they were going to start with in town NPC names. I needed to know where the other local villages are. So look at this map here. <laughs> it is a map, believe it or not. This was the start and this was my uh, town that I eventually started to call Grimmage Stop. But uh, when I first started, I didn't know what it was called. I'll just put start. And then if you see here, there's some names that might look familiar. I decided this town was at a crossroads of four cardinal directions. And each one of those directions was going to lead to one of the modules that I had in my collection. So if they go to the east, they're going to end up with the keep on the borderlands. If they went to the north, they were going to end up in Orlane, which is the setting for against the cult of the reptile god. If they went to the west, they were going to end up in the setting for this uh, module, the Lost City. I would change this now because this uh, that part of the world is not really where this module should take place. This needs to be more out in the desert just based on the architecture. And also the environment of this is about a desert adventure. So I would move this now, but at the time I thought maybe I would include this. And then if they went to the south, they would end up here in Scenic Dunsmouth which is a newer adventure, obviously written for Lamentations of the Flame Princess, but it's very compatible with BX rules. The one thing I would have to change in this is that this involves a lot of spiders. It is actually core to this adventure, but um, I would change that uh, just due to some issues with my daughter. Uh, she actually has PTSD and it manifests itself. Um, she had a life-threatening accident when she was a kid. She was in a coma for a while because of it. And her PTSD coming out of that manifested as a fear of spiders. The accident wasn't caused by spiders. It's just through therapy. We discovered like that's why she has that PTSD about spiders. So I didn't want to include that. That was part of our session zero. Or I actually did it at the beginning of this because I had forgotten to do it in our session zero. But I mentioned to the other players who knew about my daughter's accident. They knew about her fear of spiders and asked them, is there anything else besides that that you don't want to include? And partially it was just really graphic descriptions of violence. One player got really queasy uh, one time. And uh, when I started to kind of talk about depictions of violence. And so I, that was my limit. And I said, okay, I won't ever do that again. Okay. So, um, I drew this map. Now, if you watch Professor Dungeon Master's Dungeon Craft YouTube channel, this might start to be looking very, very familiar. It's because I was very much inspired by his Caves of Carnage campaign. That is actually what the impetus was for me to, to start planning this campaign. I saw those during the early part of the pandemic lockdowns, and I started to 
figure out that I wanted to run my campaign that way. So I talked to Professor Dungeon Master all the time on Twitter. I talked to him in his YouTube comments. Uh, I have um, direct message with him before. He is aware that I am doing that. So I'm not stealing from him because as the professor says, it's not stealing, it's DMing. I'm taking inspiration from him and you will see a lot of his ideas repeated here, but I'm modifying them for my group and my play style, okay? So I drew this town map out. I knew I had to practice my um, NPC voices or personality quirks. I needed a rumor table and I needed to detail um, my bad guys. So that was kind of where I got started. And then I needed to put together some rumors. I wanted them to have rumors. So I made a list of what these rumors are down here. Again, I know it's very, very difficult to read. I'm going to show you how I eventually transfer this into something that's more usable at the table. But I started to make a list of rumors to help build the world. And a lot of these, I didn't know what was going to happen with them. I don't have them pre-planned out. I didn't know, like if I said, um, you know, uh, wizards were hunted to extinction by the church. I actually put a question mark because I didn't know if that was going to be true. So I put that down as a possibility. But um, I also uh, put a thing like how the great church hates wizards. Um, and, you know, the road is dangerous when you're traveling out of town. There was a cloaked rider who's been seen on the road or moonlight. Now, that one was something that was going to come up as like my big bad guy, uh, or at least a potential big bad guy. I didn't want to force them into that, but it was, you know, foreshadowing if that came up. Right. So those were rumors. Now, how was I going to distribute those rumors? Well, I had them start at a festival and rather than dropping them into combat, the way that I had them interact at this festival is I had different NPCs that I had planned for. I started to make a list of like different NPC types in here and who they were going to be. I gave them names and personality types, and I had them approach them to do a series of contests. And this was going to help them learn how to roll dice and know when to check for things and also to understand that they don't roll dice until I tell them to, until I say, hey, roll die for this. So there was a strength uh, contest via a cart lifting exercise. And so I had a player or an NPC go around and announce like, it's time for the cart lifting contest. You know, it's one silver piece to enter. They really struggle with like, do they want to spend a whole silver piece to enter this contest? But they did. And uh, the strength contest, I did it on a straight D20 roll. I know there's different ways of doing that. One of the things that BX and early editions of D&D have about them that are kind of charming, but they're also sometimes a little bit of an inelegant game design is that you roll different things for different activities when really they're all coming down to the same thing. So if to roll an attack in this game, you want to roll high in a D20. But if you want to make a feat of strength, you roll a D20 and roll low. You want to roll under your strength score on a D20. Or if you want to bust down a door that's been locked and you can't you can't pick the lock, so you have to break the door down, you actually are rolling a D6, but you're still adding your strength and melee attack bonus. It starts to get really confusing. It gets even worse in AD&D where they add a percentage chance based on strength for bending bars and lifting gates. So you've got four different uses of strength, a roll high, a roll low, a D6, and a or you know, D20 roll high, D20 roll low, a D6, and a and a percentage die, all for doing strength-based things. I don't want to deal with that. So I had them roll high on a D20 and add their their appropriate attribute bonus. Uh, for this. So I know a lot of old timers might bulk at that, but that's how I did it for my game. So they rolled the D20. The, the person who rolled the highest won and got coins back. The person, uh, then we had an archery contest. So they uh, decided to enter that. Interesting part of that was that uh, I only let them enter if they'd bought a bow. Bows were not provided. So this was a, an example of make sure you've equipped your character appropriately and have a ranged weapon because you're going to need it eventually. So some of the characters wanted to enter the contest, but they, they didn't have a bow. So they were borrowing the bow to take different shots. And that was a dexterity check. Looks like a missile attack. Then I had... Uh, the cleric player wanted to enter the archery contest. I should have let him, or maybe I could have let him, but I was using this as an example to point out that clerics in this version of the game can't use bows and arrows because arrows are sh sharp edged weapons, and clerics in this version of the game cannot use edged weapons. So he wanted to join, and I said he can't, and that was really more of an exercise for the other players to understand, like, your cleric is not going to have a missile weapon, like a ranged weapon at least a bow and arrow or a crossbow. Okay. So that was part of how I dealt with that. Then, um, uh, there, I had an old woman talk. She was sitting out like, you know, admiring the issues, very old. And she was admiring the festival and there was a dance going on. And so she started to interact with the characters and tell them about how, when she was younger, she met her future husband 
at that dance when she was a little kid. And so she likes to come back every year, even though he's passed on now from old age, she likes to come back and, uh, you know, look at the youngsters dancing because it just reminds her of when she was a little girl, when she met her husband. So I was doing that as a setup to then have three or four actually uh, suitors come up. The cleric had made it clear that he was not going to participate in the dance. So I had four suitors come up to the young, uh, young players, my daughter and her friends, and uh, the thief player right out, she was just like, nope. And she left. She was playing the 12 year old. She's like, that's weird. If someone wants to dance with the 12 year old. I was like, but no, he's also 12. Like, it's just a kid stand. She's like, nope. So she left. And then the other players, uh, I had the uh, people approach. So and had to give flowers to the girls and ask them to dance. And one of them accepted the flower and then left. And I talked about how the boy was all dejected and sad. And then the other two players decided to go through with the dance. And so while they were dancing, I had them make charisma checks. I could have done the reaction roll table from BX. I'll talk about that in future videos. Uh, but it's a key part of the game. It's a 2D6 roll. So it's a bell curve instead of a linear curve. I didn't do that. I just did a straight D20 plus your charisma bonus. And uh, and the, uh, the winner of that, if they succeeded, they got um, a rumor. Okay. So a rumor from the boys that they were talking with at the dance. So that was where that came from. And then I added one thing that, so those all come from like, if you're, again, if you've seen the Caves of Carnage, you've seen Dungeon Craft, the Professor Dungeon Master did those in his videos. Um, his dance was, was courting and uh, it was a little bit more adult. And I, of course, I didn't want to go that route. So I tried to make it a little bit more on the innocent and, and do more of, of a dance. Um, and, but each of those two players, they met somebody uh, that could be a future contact and it's going to come up later. Uh, but I also had someone approach the cleric player since he didn't participate in the dance. I wanted to give him something to do. So I had someone who was um, tipsy on ale come up, buy him an ale, talk to him about his faith because he could tell from the way that he dressed that he wasn't part of what I call the great church. He was part of this other thing and talk about it. And the player said, oh, I'm out. You know, I'm seeking mysteries. I'm seeking knowledge. And this guy said, oh, well, if you're seeking that, you should go see the fortune teller. She's up in that, you know, gaudily painted wagon up on the hill there as part of the festival. And so I did a fortune telling thing and I did this based on a wisdom check instead of um, charisma, uh, just because I wanted them to roll a different ability score. And in this particular one, um, the person who rolled the highest wisdom check and was going to get a, a luck point where uh, basically would let them spend that luck point to reroll failed save. They only get one and that doesn't replenish. So um, the cleric player ended up actually being the one that got that. The other players didn't want to have their fortunes read, but after the cleric player had his read, um, they realized that was kind of fun. And so they spent the silver pieces. And then on a whim, I hadn't planned this ahead of time, but the thief player went last and she asked to have her fortune read. And I don't know why I did this, but I just had the fortune teller react sort of negatively to her, push her money back and say, no, nope. like her face turned pale. And she said, no, I'm not going to read your fortune. And so uh, please leave my tent. And I thought that could be something that could come up later. And in fact, it does in the game. So uh, that was it for sort of the, the things that happened at the festival. So then after what happened was the players uh, were approached again by the people that they've been dancing with who said, oh, we heard that like you were looking for, you know, to the cleric player, you were looking for knowledge and adventure. Well, there's these ancient ruins on the outskirts of town out in the woods, and we can go show them to you. And they were doing it basically to impress the, the elf players, because in this world or in this city, elves, like there were no elves that living there it was all humans. So these elves were sort of, uh, they stood out a little bit. And so they wanted to impress them. And so they took the elves out there and that's where they ended up meeting the bad guy uh who was uh, again modeled on the um sort of the worm that walks he's just he's his body is made of worms and snakes and lizards and spiders and cockroaches and all kinds of stuff covered like with a hood that holds everything together so sort of like a really gross oogie boogie but worse not comical but super evil and so they saw him out in the forest he was carving symbols into a rock with a special dagger. And then he saw them, looked at them and said, and again, if you've seen the Caves of Carnage, you know this, he said, where's the keystone? And the that almost acted as like a powerful magical mind attack that I dealt with like a sleep spell. I had them make saves and some of the characters failed their saves, but they felt like their minds being attacked by this powerful creature. So uh, they decided to, um, the thief player decided to shoot at the guy 
Uh, she rolled a natural 20. So that is just an automatic hit. There's no extra damage, at least at the time in this version of the game. I changed that later. So she knew that she hit. So she hit the guy and he didn't react at all like to having this crossbow bolt basically pierce where his heart should have been. And so they realized they were in trouble. And so they grabbed their player, uh, their comrades and like firemen carried them uh, out of the force and ran back into the town. I had one of the NPCs pick up uh, one of the characters ended up being my daughter's character who had fallen unconscious from this mind attack. And uh, he ends up, and I just was kind of dealing with this as they were running out. I made it up as we went along, but he ends up tripping and he dropped her. And so he couldn't keep going because he wasn't strong enough. He ends up grabbing her ankle and basically pulling her behind him as he's running through the forest. And this just became a hilarious thing that came up time and time again in this game over the years is this memory of this guy dragging my daughter's character um, by her ankles. So after the characters got back to town, uh, they were trying to warn them that this guy, this crazy, whatever you want to call him, guy, warm snake, guy was in the forest with a bunch of cultists of his that I described as basically human looking guys with animal heads, you know, stag, elk, deer, pig, bear, they, goat. And so they thought that these were like animal men hybrids. That's what the characters saw when they were off in this grove. So I had detailed all those and, you know, my notes here, I'd, when I was making notes about the things I was going to make, I was trying to, I started to write down some details on, you know, the things that I needed to know. Turns out I made these just like the professor did. These aren't actual men, human or man, animal hybrids. They're, they're just cultists that are wearing beast masks, but because it was in the distance, the characters thought that they were some kind of monster. So they uh, came into town to warn the town, but the townspeople after the festival were, had been drinking, they were tipsy. A lot of them, a lot of them had also gone to bed. And so they were like, oh, this, what a fun story. It's a scary story. Ha ha. Like, that's cool. You're getting the spirit of our fall festival. And then uh, the, the bad guy ends up uh, setting fire to the town and uh, at the outskirts. And so they see the flames running. So I, I did a whole chaotic thing where I had characters running to and fro, the fire spreading. And the, the PCs were trying to figure out like, oh, do we want to fight these guys? But they kind of knew from having shot at the guy and, and had that had no effect that like probably they were ill-equipped to deal with this. And so I had the old woman that had come out to start talking to them about how, you know, she loved going to the dance every year. So I had her come out of her house and, and she, she saw what was happening and she yelled at them to run. So, yeah, it was a little bit of like a, a DM prompt, but I was letting them know, you know, they have the choice. But I wanted to also let them know, like, this isn't a video game where, like, you have to do things in a certain order. If they wanted to run, they were well within their rights to do that. And so they picked up on that prompt and they were like, OK. And then one of the guys kind of charged at them. And they realized that they were going to outmatch. He was bigger and he had better weapons than they did. And so they ran. They ran out of the town. And uh, that's kind of how we ended that particular session. So they did ask um, some questions and they were trying to figure out. But I said, you know, you got to tell me what direction are you running? Which are you going to go basically east, west, north or south? And they decided to go east because that was the direction that was exactly opposite of where the bad guy had been coming from uh, on the outskirts of town on the forest. And so they ran to the east, which meant that they were going to end up in uh, the town near the keep on the borderlands, as I talked about earlier, which I was super excited about because, I mean, honestly, this is where I wanted them to start, but I didn't want to push them that way. So it did work out. I did, as you saw on my map, I had a plan where if they'd gone to one of the other towns, I just would have used one of the other adventures, but they didn't. They decided to go here. So, um, so that's that. So really quickly, let's talk about... Um, I talked about these rumors that I had here. So I end up retyping those in this notebook that I use. So this is how I transfer things. I, uh, at the time I used to write them, but um, I have some, like, I made a little menu for the, uh, the tavern, but I pasted inside my notebook, the tables that I would mo most frequently use attack tables and saving throw tables for the different classes. And then in the back, uh, I did the same kind of thing. I just put some more tables that I knew were going to come up the most often in this version of the game. So I had the equipment lists and I had uh, the attack matrices and saving throws for monsters. So, but then for the first session, I ended up, uh, you know, basically retranscribing my notes, 
drawing this map out so I knew kind of where everything was. And then I had my NPCs here. Again, some of this is influenced or, or, or directly copied from the stuff that Professor DM did. But I talked, I just had notes for myself to remind me, like at the festivals, food, beer, music, banners, there's games. Uh, I had an NPC a thief end up approaching the thief player, said she didn't want to be in the dance and introduce her to the idea of beggars guilds and thieves guilds and thief uh, talk, thieves can't and secret symbols that she could use. So she understood that that was part of her character's development. And then uh, I had an, this is the NPC that ended up talking to the cleric player. And then I had my rumor table. So if this is something that interests you, maybe you just want to borrow it for a game or just get inspired by this, let me know, send me an email below and I can send you a copy of this rumor table and it'll be more nicely formatted for you. So those are my notes. And then I had, uh, you know, more details here on the, the vermin Lord and the cultists and the map here. And then I had more NPC names that I divided into columns uh, based on sort of the country or the time period that inspired them from earth history. So if those are names that you want, you wanna borrow those, again, send me a, an email and I will send those off to your, uh, send those off your way. So that's kind of how I do my notes. Now, just to give you a sample, um, I got tired of handwriting notes because I also, I just think my writing is horrible. So I started to do things like this where I would type it out and then paste it into my book. This is much easier for me to run at the table like this than trying to read my chicken scratch notes. So those are my notes. So let me talk a, a little bit about a few challenges that I've had. Uh, well, first off, let me go into my world building. So the way that I started the world building, this is very, very basic. But uh, at the my very first session, uh, or before my first session, really quickly though, this is uh, these are notes that my daughter gave me after our session zero, where she told me that I should be more interactive with the players. I should ask them to take breaks, which I hadn't thought about and I should have. And that it doesn't always have to be about D&D. &D. And that's where I realized like she's into this more to hang out with her friends than she is to play D&D, &D, which is fine. I don't really care. That's a, you know, she needs that, that kid time. But I kind of started out by drawing a map that I've never ended up using and I would completely change it now. But I was trying to get a sense of what nations were in this world so that I could give them a sense of like what kind of personalities and cultures were they gonna uh, deal with. So I typed that up in this document here, you see, sent it to them, it was just two pages. Um, and I sent that to them and that's when I realized uh, some of the challenges that I was gonna have with this game. So first off, I realized I can't plan too far ahead. So developing the world even that much was too much for them. Um, because they weren't going to read that. And so I really needed to just focus on the area that we were in at the time. Um, also, uh, for my world building, uh, I, I tried to be very, very basic. So I kind of said like, oh, here's some ideas of like different character types you might have. I gave them pictures. I was very visual. Like, here's what an elf looks like. Here's what a dwarf looks like. And gave them different examples. I got them all from Pinterest. I put them in a nice document so they could get a sense of like, these are what these types of characters look like in the world so they could model their characters. And I gave them some senses of like, here's what clerics can be. Here's what a fighter can be. Uh, in terms of, you know, not just a fighter, but like, what, what does that mean in the world? And uh, I gave them a tiny, tiny bit on here's the list of some faiths, but you should probably pick a faith or a religion for your character. They didn't read any of it except for the dad player. They didn't look at any of it. And I discovered at this time some of the challenges now that I was going to have with this group, which is that uh, they don't read emails in between sessions. They never read emails. This is an age group that just frankly doesn't read them. But honestly, I have trouble with the parents because I went to the idea of asking the parents, please tell your kid to read these emails. And then I would go like two, three weeks getting the parents even to respond to me. And a lot of times what I'm asking is, when are you guys available to play again? I try to set it up at the end of each session. It never works out that way. I tried to make it a consistent day each month. Like let's do the third Saturday. That didn't work out. These kids have way too many activities. So we play on either a Saturday or a Sunday and it's never consistent, whether it's the first, second, third or fourth Saturday or Sunday of the month. It's never consistent. And so it's always like pulling teeth to get them like, when can you play so we can schedule something? And um, so, I found like the parents aren't reading the emails, neither are the kids. Um, also the kids, the idea of opening an attachment like a PDF was just not something that they were used to doing. Uh, so then my wife suggested put everything on Google Drive. I'm sure that sounds very like an easy solution to do. I don't use Google Drive, it's just not my thing. So 
it never occurred to me to do that. But then my wife reminded me that they were using Google Drive for school, like all their schoolwork is on Google Drive because they're using Chromebooks with no storage space. So I said, okay, so I created a Google Drive for a game that you see here. And I put all the documents in and I labeled them and it was very clear and I tried not to overwhelm them stuff. And they're still not looking at this stuff. So I just learned, I can't count on these guys to do anything in between sessions. The other problem with communication was that this group, uh, especially when we started out, only uh, uh, there were five players and of the five only, uh, well, one of them is a dad, but two of the girl players, not including the dad, uh, that had cell phones or mobile phones, the other two did not. So I couldn't count on texting these people because I don't want to necessarily, I don't need to be texting my daughter's friends. That felt a little odd to me. And I, she needs to have, you know, her separation between friends and parents. So I didn't want necessarily wanted to do that, but also the cell phones became an issue during the game because the players, both of them got them while we in, in the course of playing the game. So they didn't have them at the start. And as soon as they got them, they started uh, spending all their time looking at their cell phones, especially during the session. And it was becoming a problem and they were ignoring the other players. They were ignoring me. So I made a new rule. I put a basket in the middle of the table. And at the beginning of every session, I ask every player to turn their cell phone off and put it in the middle of the table. I have told their parents that I'm doing this. So there's an emergency and they need to get a hold of someone. They can call me because I will have my phone on, but I'm not going to be looking at it during the game. And the players were actually fine with that. They didn't argue or complain. The one thing they did ask was, can we have breaks so that we can check our phones more often? And I said, sure. So we do breaks about every 30 to 60 minutes but the longer time's gone on the fewer they actually ask for those phone breaks they're not actually even interested in them anymore as much they will ask for breaks to get food and to go to the bathroom but a lot of times they'll take breaks and they'll just leave their phone in the basket uh, the other thing i was talking about how they were looking at their phones during the session not paying attention to me i had to talk to this group about how you know chit chat during the game while other people are talking is very disruptive. It's very distracting. And, you know, talking about the game is one thing, but if you're having a conversation on the side while I'm trying to talk and lay and lay out the, you know, what, what's going on in the game, it's, it's disrespectful and it's distracting and other people can't, people can't hear. So we made the rules. Like if I'm talking, I'm the DM, I'm the referee. If I'm talking, you're not talking. And I know that might sound harsh, but I just needed to put it in very clear terms. I, I had a problem with two players, it specifically that are very good friends and they don't see each other for the most part because they go to the same school other than at these scheduled play times for the game so they would just sit and be talking the whole game and it was a problem and so i to nip that in the butt i just basically had to say like if i'm talking you're not talking if another player's talking you're not talking so please don't do that and it took a while but they got back to it so what i wanted to ask for your help on is this idea of like communication for players in between sessions. And again, this isn't just a kid versus adult thing. It's probably more of an issue with kids, but how do you guys deal with this? Do you have any suggestions for how to do things in between sessions when players aren't reading their emails or their texts or whatever it is? Drop those suggestions below, please. I would really appreciate it. So uh, that is actually gonna wrap up this particular video. I know this one went a little long, but I am pretty excited about it. As you can tell, I love this campaign for my daughter. So I, I do tend to talk a little bit more about it and add a little bit more details. I will try to streamline them a little bit more in the future as we move on. But uh, next up, I will be, uh, at least for this series, the next video in this series, I'll be talking about the second session. It was all a road encounter on the road. And I'll talk about how I built my encounter table and then share that with you if you want. And then uh, next up for my history videos, I'm going to be doing one on the history of Magic and D&D specifically why it was designed mechanically the way it was designed, that sort of fire and forget type of thing. So until then, I'd like to say uh, thank you so much for watching. Happy gaming. Stay safe. And I'll talk to you next time. And here's the bonus content for today's video. What I was drinking, what I was listening to, I was making the notes. So drinking wise, this was a Golden State Cider, an apple cider from a cidery up in Healdsburg, California. Healdsburg is kind of close to Sonoma. It's very dry, very crisp cider. And I had it in my uh, Green Lantern pint glass, as you can see here. Listening, I was listening to this record. This is by Sly and the Family Stone. There's a riot going on, originally from 1971. This is a repress. And this was kind of fun because it came with an art print that was special to this release. And also, 
the vinyl itself was done on this fancy colored vinyl. They called it love and hate, and they spelled hate like the street hate Ashbury in San Francisco. So that's it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Talk to you next time.